Hello and good day. Thank you for joining us today on Hope for Families. I am your host, Don McCarty, and I am the chair of the National Parents Organization in Florida. And I work very closely with Danica Joan with Hope for Families and Kids Need Both as board members. And I'm also a former child survivor of parental alienation. And today I advocate for child's inalienable rights to have access to both of their safe and loving parents. And it just goes without saying that we never support any circumstances where a child may be in an unsafe environment. But today our guests are here to talk about something that is really similar to my story where my parents were not legally married. So I wanna dive right in um, and, and introduce them to you. In the United States, 40% of all births occur with unmarried parents. And unfortunately, many parental alienation cases begin with a baby out of wedlock situation. So we have today with us Jim and Jessica Braz, and I hope I said that correctly. Please correct me if I didn't. Um, Close. Are, sorry? Close enough. Okay. <laughs> they are the authors of the award-winning book, Baby Out of Wedlock, Co-Parenting Basics from Pregnancy to Custody. And in addition to that, they are, offer free consulting services from their website, which is www dot baby out of wedlock dot com and where they help people navigate the complexities of an unmarried surprise parent pregnancy so each of them have gone through this, this these situations themselves um, and it, their situation also includes nasty divorce or um, custody battle excuse me and they wrote this book to help answer questions um, that many of you may be going through and it's a stressful, very stressful ordeal. So Jim, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to give you a moment to share a little bit about yourselves and then we'll just continue that conversation from there. Sure, uh, well, thank you thank for you. having us. Uh, yeah, so uh, about 10 years ago, we each had children born out of wedlock with people that we didn't want to marry. And um, it was one of the most stressful ordeals of our lives and we can remember all the difficult questions we had and nobody seemed to have the answers because it seems like we all know a divorced person, but their situation is slightly different. And when you have a uh, never been married situation, the child is, is not even born yet. So your questions surround about in, you know, infant questions. There's often a, a bigger distance between homes. There's the whole idea that, well, the, the, the child doesn't even know you yet. So why do you have to be there you know, half the time? And so it, it, it leads to, um, in, in my opinion, it can lead to a more likely parental alienation situation. And thankfully that did not happen with either myself or Jessica. We still see our kids, you know, all the time. And, and um, you know, we've been involved in their lives from day one, but I feel like it could have gone that way. And we did have to battle our, our heads off in order to get there. So, um, you know, I hope today we can talk about, you know, how baby out of wedlock situation can be uh, a good thing and, and the, the, the bad alienation and the bad custody battle can be avoided. So that's the goal of our book. That's why we wrote it. And I uh, hope we can get through some of those topics today. And uh, I think our situation is unique because it was coming from the woman's side from my, my, myself and the mm -hmm. man's side with Jim. So we, we helped each other through the process. We've known each other for how many years now? Well, we've known <laughs> each other for a long time, but when we had our first children, we were you know nothing more than old acquaintances. We were friends. And so we were, uh, you know, comparing notes. Well, how, what's going on in your battle? Uh, Jessica has a son. I have a daughter from this first situation. And so we really, um, you know, sort of went through it together. And then four or five years later, we started dating and, and ended up married. And now we have uh, a four-year-old of our own and, and actually another one on the way, yep. which we just found out about recently. Right. <laughs> I went on mute. Congratulations. That's Thank you. Thing. Yeah, we're, we're coming out to the world with that breaking news. <laughs> News, right here. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for that. And you know, I did read your book. And in fact, I, I forgot to take off my blur. Let me because I, I read your book and I have it and I have it right there. Mm, yes, um, there it is. Nice. <laughs> um, and it is an amazing book. And in the beginning of the book, one of the things that you talk about is that this book is for the unmarried couple, and you stress that several times. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, this is this is really good for people that don't know how to navigate. They don't need to go through that divorce um, setting or that experience, but they still need to figure out how to co-parent. So where where are all those best yeah. practices and that stuff? But when I read your book, I have to say 
that the advice that you give when it comes to custody mm-hmm. is excellent. And that I think applies towards everybody. So even if you are married, yep. read this book. This book. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to jump in on this because in my co-parenting course, everybody, um, every parent of minor children who are going through custody situations have to take the, the co-parenting course. And they, and a lot of times it's referred to as the divorce court course. And then I get the participants reaching out and they're like, well, I was never divorced. Why am I having to take this course? And they don't get that it's about the dynamic, not necessarily the, the legalities of, of mm-hmm. the relationship. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's, you know, it, it, I thought it was super important. It, and I'm so glad that you are addressing things from the perspective of, it, it doesn't matter whether you're married or not. Mm-hmm. The importance is that the children have to have, you know, have a relationship with both parents. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, there are some important differences between the two situations, but at the end of the day, the kid needs both parents. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, every, I know everyone on this call agrees with that. And all the experts we talked to, uh, you know, said the same thing when we were writing the book. You know, one person put it very well. She said something along the lines of, you know, whatever parenting um, um, uh, method you want to employ, it, none of that matters as much as the conflict between the two parents. And if two homes with you know, no conflict or, or low conflict is always better than one home with a lot of conflict. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we're shooting for here. Mm. You know, yeah. some, something that occurs to me is, um, okay, so your relationships ended and I'm not sure if they, they ended um, before the baby was born or, or after and, and all that. But the point is, is there are a lot of people who, who find themselves pregnant and the relation, there is no relationship or the relationship is over and they really don't see anything wrong with finding a surrogate co-parent. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. What's your, what's your perspective on somebody just replacing the bio parent? Yeah, it's tough because they never had that co-parenting relationship. So sometimes in ways of divorce, I mean, divorce can be terrible, but they've co-parented already. So they kind of know the other person. So it makes it more difficult. And a divorce, I mean, you at least you sort of know your enemy, if you will. You kind of know if they play by the rules or if they're good parents or not. But when it's a baby out of wedlock situation, you sometimes just really don't know the person very well. And so, you know, you could might understand how, you know, a mother, for example, might say, I don't trust this guy to be alone with my infant, you know, even though he is the father. And you might realize how a a father would say, you know, I don't trust this, this mother. She's, you know, I've never seen her in action before. I don't know if she can be a good mom. And so you can see how there's just, there's nowhere to even begin a parenting relationship from. And so it can really spiral into terrible place. And, you know, that's kind of what happened to me. Jessica had a better situation where she's sort of the success story in our book. You know, she had a rough first 12 months. Um, her ex, you know, did, had a terrible lawyer who was not a family lawyer. And he was giving him, you know, terrible advice, free advice, but terrible advice. And as a result of that, they went through a, a, a situation where he was trying to get sole physical custody for a while out of sort of like an anger thing. <clears throat> and, you know, so that obviously went to a custody battle. Eventually it ended about a year into it. And ever since then, everything has been great. Jessica and him worked together very well. They see, you know, the, the kid uh, sees both parents all the time, her son. For me, on the other hand, we had a year where um, my daughter's mother did not trust me to be around, you know, be a, a, an overnight parent. She said, you can see your daughter anytime you want in my home. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, so for the whole first year while the custody battle was going on, I went to her home every day, every week and spent time in the basement with mom and my daughter. And it wasn't fun time. You know, every time the baby might cry, mom would say, oh, let me, let me nurse her again. And, you know, she was very into the attachment parenting. She didn't want our daughter to cry for one second. And she thought that, you know, breastfeeding around the clock was the thing that counted. And so she, you know, almost felt like she was failing as a mother if she were to give me overnight visits, you know, somewhere before age five. And so it really took us all the way up to the day of our trial where finally somebody knocked some sense into our attorney or somebody said like, you're going to lose. If you go to this trial, you know, you got to give him something that he wants. So what we compromised on was 
after a year of a court battle, we had another year long phase in where I would get slightly more time leading up to overnight visits in a number of months. And I was willing to do that because, you know, you don't want the judge to decide your fate in these situations. Um, and I had seen my daughter every weekend of her life. So, you know, I was, it wasn't like I was alienated at that point. Right. So I would, to answer your question, though, I think that you don't have that foundation with that co-parent. You don't know how they're going to co-parent. So you had asked, is it easier to bring someone new in? Is, was that what you were saying? A step parent. No. Another yeah. parent, because it's almost like starting off fresh. And then you're seeing that new co-parent with your child and, and you're trusting, it's, you know, over the months and years you're trusting and the actual parent you never had that with. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure it, it, it's. And then tack on a, a long legal battle, and now you hate this person. Right. And yeah. the last thing you want to do is work together. Yeah, yeah there's the trail. Your enemies. Yeah. 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 There's just there's just such feelings of betrayal and um and abandonment and just the whole swirl. And and right. what I'm hearing is that you know the uh, when you find yourself with a child, you love your child, but you you maybe find the the relationship you had as a mistake. Let's erase the mistake and replace the players so that we still have this happy family and they don't get mm -hmm. that. <laughs> no, you can't. You don't have the right to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. One of the things that I talk about quite a bit is that my my parents are not replaceable. You might have remarried someone else. You know, they both remarried, but they personally were not replaceable or should not have been. So I love that we're, we are talking about um the situation because i think it's something that we do need to have more conversations around when you do bring in another co-parent because of a merit you know you're you're moving on you have another relationship but the child still needs to have access to their mm -hmm. to their biological parent and that's difficult especially yeah. in your situation where you don't go through the court system to determine a lot of that without having to really focus on just heading into that custody situation where you have the mediation and you have this agree parenting agreement, which you talk about quite a bit. And you laid out very um, specifically how the, the path that you took and that um, the, uh, uh, as the events transpired, you talked about all of that, where your difficulties lied. So the book really does help navigate people, I think, because I, I was listening to it as if, oh my gosh, if I was going through this, that totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that other people that are reading it, I think, I hope that it sinks into them as well, where it just, it really makes sense to try and avoid the conflict, try to continue forward. You never once asked for more custody than than um, you you were you weren't ever asking for full custody. That's right. Mm -hmm. You just wanted access to your child as equally as possible, which I think most parents do want to have when they go through this. They want to have access to their children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was saying to Jessica before we got on the air here is that if I could go back and write another edition of the book or change something in the book, I think we would spend more time on the 50-50 shared parenting issue. When we went through it, you know, we didn't this was 10 years ago, 50-50 shared parenting wasn't hardly a thing yet. Mm -hmm. And when we wrote the book just one or two years ago, you know, uh, over the last year we wrote it, it didn't occur to us. We didn't realize what a movement was going on in this country for 50-50 shared parenting. It was only after we published the book and started to speak with people like yourselves and the father's rights movement and, and various people that we realized this is, this is a solution here. This 50-50 shared parenting really does a lot to not just, you know, be good for the child, but it reduces the conflict because there's no reason to spend, you know, 50 grand on lawyers if the outcome is going to be 50-50 shared parenting. That's the automatic ball. Yeah, it's ball. that constant fight for I want more time, so I'll get more money. Mm -hmm. And the lawyers push that as well. And then you end up with, you know, a mess. And, and you know, I spent $160,000 in, in legal fees. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Jessica had a good situation and she, she spent 30. So, like, it's not it's not affordable. And if we could get to this 50-50 place, then I think that would solve a lot of the problems, yeah. not to mention better for the children. And I get that you, you're speaking of, you, you brought up a good point that you're not, you don't want it to be the decision to be in the hands of the judge. You right. know, you don't want to put all your eggs in that, in that 
court basket mm -hmm. and give all your power over to an attorney who it's advantageous for them for for this battle to continue. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, with the, uh, you know, when we wrote the book, I, I so I, I was not asking for full custody. I was not even asking for 50-50 custody, and that's because we lived at a far distance. And so I think it took us a long time to figure out, you know, the, re the, the, the geographic distance matters a lot. That so was a that really important thing, too, that you addressed. You talked yeah. about, well, my parents live in another state, you mm -hmm. know, and, and where can I go with my child or where can't I go with my child? That was another issue that you addressed in there, too. And I don't think people think about all of those little intricacies yeah. to what happens with, with children when, we're, when they are with the other parent. Yeah. You know, something I, I noticed that you also brought up is you really had have an understanding of where your co-parent, what, what your co-parent was thinking. Yes, um, that's very important. In the fear of, you know, like it, you can't always label them with a disorder and, and all that. I mean, you really have to say, OK, what what is it like for their um, from their perspective? And back in the day where, you know, if a mom didn't get primary time with the child, what does it say about her as a mother? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah just... my, my daughter's mother definitely had those kinds of feelings where she wanted to be a super mom. You know, she, she actually breastfed our daughter till she was four years old every day of her life. I mean, that's, that's a long time to breastfeed somebody. And, um, you know, she definitely had these fears. And so one of the things of our book is it's definitely written from both the woman's and the man's perspective. And, you know, we've had readers, uh, I can think of one woman in particular that said the best part about your book was I started to understand what the guy's point of view was. Mm -hmm. And if you can just understand each other's point of view a little better, then you don't have, you know, you realize there's no reason to go to toe to toe in the legal yeah. battle. And ideally, you can get together with a person, you can say, all right, this is the arrangement that'll work for us. Let's tell the lawyers to draw it up. Done. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, you're really good at Oops, sorry, go ahead, Jessica. I was just saying they have to try to let go of the anger because a lot of that fear and unknown um, being thrown in that situation, it's scary. And then you get angry at the other person and you have to really be empathetic. You have to sit down, talk, put yourself in the other person's shoes, not bash each other. That's just, it, that just doesn't. I mean, me for one, I, I made so many mistakes in that <laughs> arena. Um, you know, every time. Uh, and you I, share that. That's, a, that's yeah. another piece of that. Your book is really... I'm like, wow, that really kind of explains a lot of the two sides of the situation where you saw, okay, I did this, but then I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yep. Maybe I should have considered this. And you were really good about pointing all of that out. So you not once did you, this was never a one-sided story that you were telling. You were telling both sides. That's what I tried to do. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear you agreed with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely how I took that. So um you talk a lot about your top 12 concerns yeah we put that together i actually printed it out here just because uh sometimes people ask us about it go ahead yeah I, I would just like to give you the floor on that a little bit so you can talk about why are these 12 concerns your top well over the last uh you know 10 years we seem to all the time get a, a friend or a family member that says you know so and so got their girlfriend pregnant and they want to you know ask you some questions and, and it's always the same kind of questions the number one first question is always about paternity tests. People, and this is a not just from the men, but the women want to know too, like, when is a, you know, why does he need a paternity test? And the man wants to know, you know, it's not my baby, you know, let's do a paternity test. And so everybody gets into crazy arguments about that. Right, and then it can be insulting sometimes. The woman, yeah, the woman gets him. insulted. How dare you ask yeah. for a paternity test? So <laughs> I, that too, where you got, you either want to know or you, you want to prove it or you want to disprove it on yeah. both sides. And so my daughter's mother was insulted when our lawyer asked for a paternity test. And, you know, we said, listen, how sure are you that I'm the father? She said, I'm 100% sure, 110% sure. And I said, well, I deserve to be that sure. So I can't be sure who you slept with because I'm not you. But if you do this test, we'll be totally sure. And so I think that's the way a woman needs to think about it is because, you know, both parents deserve to be 100% sure. And but the, but the real answer is that the courts are going to give anybody a paternity test that asks for it. And usually that is the first step. And it's the first step. I remember going into the court battle and that was the first week I got a phone call from the other lawyer, very insulted. 
my lawyer was like, this is just the norm. It's the this, norm. Is, uh, this is just, uh, you're not going to go through this. This is the first thing you need to do. The court is not going to let you continue unless this happens. Which so there's, fine. there's no need to argue during the pregnancy about paternity tests. Like, so that's an issue that, you know, me and mine okay. argued over and we shouldn't have. And it limit, eliminates the argument too, where I know that I've heard a lot of women talk about, well, he doesn't want to be involved. He's never around. He doesn't take child support seriously. He doesn't make sure he's meeting. Well, maybe if they knew 100% that they were the father, maybe they would be more um, right. a, more present in, in and yeah. be more engaged with these situations. But when there's doubt, doubt can really cloud a lot of circumstances. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think my opinion is I think there should be, because we already know the woman or the mother is 100% the mother. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's like no questions to that, right? Right. But we we may not always know if the father is without that. So we need we need to establish that from the beginning. That's my belief. I don't know how uh, other people feel about it, but I believe that it is good to have, be able, if there's a question, just to have that for peace of mind. The child knows, the father knows, everybody knows, the family, the extended family knows, yeah. and then. Mm -hmm. I also think that father's names need to be on the birth certificate, mm -hmm. not, yeah. not the husband, not anybody that they want to add on. I, it needs to be the biological father. So, I, you know, when I think about that, though, here's the tricky part. How do you say for certain I'm the father and put your name on the certificate if you haven't taken the test yet? The DNA test needs to be in there. So those two things yeah. to me. The same day. Yeah. yeah. At yeah, the hospital. That, that's right. And I just discovered that you can do a prenatal test. There's one company out there that has a reliable, real prenatal test, but it costs like $2,000. And it's not yeah. like an amniocentesis. It's not yeah. um, risky for the mother. It's, 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 it's a blood or... test. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's, um, that's number one on our list. And so we have a long list of other questions. I don't think you want to go through every one of them. You can download it on our website. But, you know, a, a few others would be family law attorney. So, you know, Jessica's uh, ex had a non-family law attorney and it just screwed them up for 12 months. Mm -hmm. He kept going for things that weren't his and he kept, you know, coming in, into court unprepared and it was a disaster for him. Like I, I have, um, let's see, I have a broken finger, but I'm going to go to a podiatrist to fix my finger. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, another common question is how is child support calculated and I remember I walked into the lawyer and I told her a little bit about my income and, and my ex's income, what I thought. And she told me a number and I said, are you crazy? Babies don't cost that much. What are you talking about? And it took me a year to understand that, that the calculation is not based on how much the baby costs. You know, it's based on how much you make relative to the other person and, and, and the, time, the time difference. Um, you know, physical custody, we already talked a lot about the 50-50 and the parenting and the geographical thing. Um, what else is on my list here? You, you talked about um, printing coordinators too, parenting yeah. coordinators. How, so, how um, so that sort of, you start that conversation when you talk about joint legal custody and decision-making rights. And so that was a, a non-starter for me. I had to have joint legal custody. I wasn't going to you know, not be allowed to make a decision with my child. And she didn't want me to have it. She wanted sole legal custody. And that was another reason we went all the way to the trial date. Finally, she gave it to me, but she said that she wanted, you know, the final say in, in certain issues. And we had this long list of what they called dispute resolution steps. And they were crazy. It was like six different steps. One of them was like, we're going to identify the problem. And then we're going to consult Wikipedia. And then we're going to talk to a friend about it. And then we're going to get a mediator that has no authority. And it was all these crazy steps that would take anybody, you know, three months to complete. And in real life, that's just not helpful. A lot of biases in there too that you're just allowing yeah. to kind of yeah. right yeah. and then we said at the end of these uh six stupid steps that you know mother would have the final say in all disputes except visitation money holidays and you know basically some other thing that the four things that everybody fights about <laughs> you know so it was totally worthless and we went back to court i say four times over these kinds of issues where you know, she thought that Christmas vacation was this way. And, and I said, no, the document says the other way. And we had an argument and we had no way to solve it. And so finally, we got a parenting coordinator involved, which was a total game changer, in my opinion. And I think even my ex, who was against the idea at first, I think she would even agree that it was 
a game changer to have rather than two of us just screaming at each other, getting nowhere, you have a third party that hears the two sides of the story and, and they're a professional, they're, they have no skin in the game with either party. And all they wanna do is help you compromise, help you come to a situation that works for the child. And so she did that with us for about a year. And um, you know, finally, uh, my, my ex did not want to renew the situation because I think she was sick of going to the meetings, you know, that we had every month with this person. But we got enough out of her that we we stopped being totally dysfunctional. And since then, we've been you know semi-functional. Uh, I'm I'm not going to say it's a great situation still, but uh, it's at least functional. You know, we can now communicate about you know when and where to have a a meeting or if there's an issue about school or something, we can talk about it in a civil manner. Um, so a parenting coordinator for me, and, and what it sort of occurred to me is if I would have had this parenting coordinator from day one, my life in those five years would have been totally different. And I think that me and her would be getting along much better if we had had this third party helping us from day one, because A, we would have avoided four other legal battles and all the money that went along with it. And it just would have been a more healthy, constructive way to, to solve disagreements with somebody that you don't really know that well. And the idea of doing it on your own, it just seems impossible looking back on it, you know? Do you think that it would be beneficial for anybody going through a custody dispute, regardless if they, you know, who's their attorney, do they also need to have a parenting coordinator or this, this team involved in that custody dispute? Well, I mean, the beauty of it is it doesn't hurt, right? So, uh, you know, a parenting coordinator charges by the hour less than a lawyer usually, and if you can get along with the person, then you don't need to attend any parenting coordinator sessions. You can have them on call as needed. So we have a dispute, we call them this month. Next week, we, next month, we don't have a dispute. We don't call them, we don't pay for them. Uh, so you can, it, it doesn't, there's no downside, in other words. Um, I mean, unless you're the parent that's saying to themselves, I don't wanna give up any control, which is how she was thinking about it at first, I think. And you know that's a false reality because even though she had a lot of the control and the power because possession is nine tenths of the law and you know she was gonna get what she wanted because she was the custodial parent, it didn't stop us from going to court five times. She still had to get a lawyer and defend herself. She still had to go through all this hell with me because you know we were arguing. And mm -hmm. so it's a false reality to think that you don't need a parenting coordinator, um, you, know, you don't need a third party to help you. And it's important, the difference between a parenting coordinator and a mediator, of course, as you know, is binding authority. To go to a mediation session that's, you know, no binding authority, you might as well just go to a therapist or sit down with, you know, your priest or something, because you're not going to get anything solved, most likely. The beauty of the parenting coordinator is at the end of the meeting, she can say, all right, I've heard both sides. I, you know, what are you guys going to do? And if you can't agree, then I'm going to decide for you. And this issue is going to be solved until the next time, you know, we meet. And I gotcha. I, I'm going to point to that because parenting coordinators typically are brought in in high conflict custody situations. So what you're saying, and I know as a mediator myself, that it's, you know, you try to get people to agree to things, but ultimately they're the ones that decide what, you know, what they're going to agree upon. So you're saying the parenting coordinator actually gets to decide when people are not agreeing. Yes, and, and that scares people, you know, because they think I don't want somebody else deciding for me. But it, it's it's that's just not how it works in real life. In real life, they don't want to make any decisions. In fact, she, I don't believe she ever made a decision for us. She would just say, "Okay, you guys have agreed on the X, and I'm going to hold you to X." So, you know, Mom, you agreed that you do the pickup next Friday. Let's let's circle back next week and see if you really did it. And, Stick with it or change it, one or the other, right? Yes, yes. And so over time, the way it works is if you had to go back to the courts because someone is being totally dysfunctional, you would then have the parenting coordinator as, as you know, um, uh, uh, what's called a witness that would say, I worked with these people for a year. I, I, you know, I saw them agree on X, Y, and Z, and parent A did not do what she said she was going to do. And that's very powerful in the courts. Now, hopefully you don't get to that point because everybody realizes there's a third party in the room that's going to hold you to these promises you've made and these agreements you've made. Um, yeah, I think something that's really important here with this, with having an, a parenting coordinator is a lot of people rely on their attorneys to come up with all these answers. And yeah. attorneys are not trained or skilled no. in that area. 
Right. Their area is law and law only. So we, we have separate doctors that we go to when we have something going on with us, right? Mm-hmm. That's the same thing when, in this situation where you go to the attorney to, dis, to help you with the legality of it. Mm-hmm. Everything else needs to be done with somebody that understands the whole parenting side of things. So I love that combination and yeah. having a, a team and, and having someone that you can go to to, to talk about the complexity of yeah. parenting that understands it and not someone that is listening to the bar association or the judge or, you know, wherever they're learning the, their, you know, their experiences with family law comes from the legal side of, in the courtroom. Yes. And, completely different in reality. You know, I think both of you, Danica and you and Dawn are getting at is, you know, there are other people besides just parenting coordinators that can help. And so the thing about a parenting coordinator, it's a voluntary arrangement. You know, both parents have to sign up for it voluntarily because you're effectively giving up your ability to fight in the courts for X amount of time. You're saying this third party is going to, you know, be our, be our judge, if you will. And so you have to volunteer for it. But sometimes you can't get your, your other parent to volunteer. I couldn't get my ex to volunteer for three years until it got so bad that she finally said, all right, I'll do it. So if you can't get a parenting coordinator because the other party won't agree to it, the next best thing, or, or you can have both, is to get yourself a coach, a parenting high conflict coach. I, I believe you guys work with a lot of those people. You, you probably do some of that work yourself. I mean, I didn't have a coach and I would have benefited hugely from that because there's so many things that I would have done better. You know, I wouldn't have responded to every text message. I wouldn't have fought back at every stupid email or every time I got screamed at on the phone. I, you know, I would have handled things totally different if I would have had a good coach at my side. I am so, so glad you mentioned that because it's true. truly there uh, a coach only advises you. Yeah. And so there's a, some some what of a trust that you you get a feeling like well okay they have my back like they're not going to navigate me towards something that's not in my best interest right. and then they ground you in get you out of the emotional reaction right um, i mean you know i don't know how many hundreds of dollars you can spend on a coach but i would have been the best investment of my life i, I would have saved so much money in, in legal bills if i would have spent you know a little bit of money on a coach um, and, you know, even if you can't get a coach, there's great podcasts out there. Try find a good podcast for a high conflict coach. There's one called, you know, Brooke Olson, the high conflict co-parenting podcast. I didn't listen to that till my daughter was 10 years old. And I just kept saying, I said, oh, my gosh, I would have I would this would have saved my life if I would have listened to this 10 years. ago." And I think a lot of people mm-hmm. make the mistake, too, of listening to their mom or their best <laughs> friend. Yes. <laughs> And that person yeah. is extremely biased, you know, no matter what, my mom is always going to be in my court, no matter what happens. So I think having that coach is important. I think that's important too. I agree with that. Mm-hmm. So Jessica, oh, sorry, Danica, did you have another question? No, well, I know I was going to comment that, um, you know, of course, I, I think all of us leaders in the work have been affected in some fashion, like with Dawn as the child of parental alienation, like with me being having been the targeted parent, now having adult children, one of which you know had a had a, a um, byproduct of being in the military, and then and and when you're telling me us the whole story of you know of all how you were marginalized, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like deja vu. Yeah. Um, and society seems to collude in that marginalization by not really having this set standard of 50-50 equal shared. Um, and, and of course, being in the military just in and itself lends itself to the ability for a parent to marginalize another parent. Yeah, for sure. You know, somebody said that to me recently is you should get this book to the military uh, community because they might have a good need for it. Um, I hear you. Yeah, absolutely. So Jessica, your story is a little bit different where I think that, um, well, I'll let you kind of describe it a little bit because I don't want to um, make any misquotes on anything, but your story is a little bit different, mm-hmm. but it still was a, a, still had a lot of conflict in trying to determine the outcome. Right. We started off uh, dating. We were together for a while and then things just kind of fizzled out. Um, And then when 
the baby was born was when <clears throat> my ex got the lawyer that wasn't the family law lawyer. And that became very, very difficult the first year of my son's life. Um, we went through a lot of ups and downs. Uh, luckily, I had my mom helping me the whole time, uh, made it easier. I had that all that support. Uh, and it took a while for us to get to a good place, which we're, now we're at that good place. We've been at that place for many, many years now, I would mm -hmm. say 11 years. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes two people are just, you know, I we guess... didn't need a co-parent <laughs> or sorry, we didn't need a coordinator or all that. You know, I, you really haven't even looked at your parenting plan since it was I, written. Yeah. You know, some I mean, people can just work together because they're right. mature adults that are not angry at each other. Uh, our start, our you know? personalities are similar we're kind of like easygoing laid back um mm -hmm. parents and i think what, what caused our contention was the the fact that the lawyer was really driving it in the beginning and there was a lot of high emotion it was i was a new mom i was scared i didn't know what was going on this was just navigating that unknown was really tough for me but um I, we really have co-parented wonderfully over the last 12 years With, you know jessica doesn't like to talk about this but in recent years, her, her father, her son's father has been coming all the way from Ohio to see her son to, Penn, to Philadelphia, a long trip. And he makes, he, trip. he makes the trip to come see his son. And he, and he, put, and he stays in an Airbnb and, um, you know, that he could, might stay for one or two weeks at a time. So then he'll come back, you know, a month later. And um, Jessica has actually been sending, you know, returning 50% of the child support that he pays her. She's been sending it back to him. Because it's just like fair is fair. You know, if you're with the child half the time and, you know, putting up this big expense to come see him, you know, she's not going to keep it all. And, and, and you know, actually in, in the last year, we actually made the decision. He's uh, in middle school now and he wanted to live with his father out in Ohio. And so he's living with his father out in Ohio as of this year. And so now uh, Jessica has been paying him mm -hmm. some child support out there because he's doing most of the, the duty. And they didn't make that change with the lawyer they didn't, you know, they just sort of came together and had a good faith discussion about it. And, um, you know, so it is possible to have a good outcome that is fair and, and amicable if you have two mature people that aren't trying to kill each other. Mm -hmm. And, right. you know, when you start out with little arguments, they escalate and spiral into bigger arguments and you go farther and farther apart until only the lawyers are talking. You know, at the birth, me and my ex were not speaking. You know, her due date came around and I thought, my baby's here and I don't know about it. And a week went by and then I got a call. I'm going into labor and I went to the hospital. But there was a, uh, it was a bad situation at that time and it was because we let it spiral. So if you can nip this in the bud, you know, both parties get some coaching. Both parties read a book like ours. Both parties get their questions answered and stop, you know, letting little things spiral into big things. It does not have to be so hard. It does not have to end in a $100,000 legal bills it does not have to end in alienation and you know you can be a success story like jessica what i love about that story that piece is that your son is going to have a different appreciation and a different outcome when it comes to dealing with conflict because he saw his parents deal with it very very maturely and in his right. interest so he's put up in the most important role in the family and that I think is important for the children where we feel important. We feel like you knew I mattered. And that is so key for, yeah. for the children growing up in this, in, in a lot of these situations where I know that parents are not intending to do damage or harm to their kids, but with this constant, you know, throughout their entire childhood, the children end up managing their parents. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a chance to be a kid. Mm -hmm. And then that's how they go forward in adulthood. So there's got to be somewhere where we can start getting people closer to that scenario where the child is the most important part of the decisions that are being made. So I admire both of you for all of everything that you've done and what you've written about, because you, you really kind of shared a lot of intimate details about your own life in order to share this story and help for the purpose of navigating through it so that that is commendable for both of you and i, I think 
uh, I just say real quick, I just think your book needs to be in every family law um, attorney's desk. He needs to read that book. Judges need to see this book. And also anybody that's going through a divorce, I mean, this should be the first search that they see in Google. <laughs> yes, I, I agree with I, you. <laughs> and I, one thing I wanted to point out is that a lot of time, for one thing, understanding what the child is going through, understanding that it's not just your battle, the two, two adults uh, in a dispute, the kid is caught in the middle and truly, st you know, statistically, you know, they talk about a child who's old enough to have experienced this battle. It's truly like uh, the death of a parent. Imagine, uh, a ch you know, being part of putting your child through the experience of a death Living bereavement. and yeah. and they have it and and you and the other point I wanted to make is that a lot of people think it takes two and they're so frustrated because their other parent is not on this on board and they and what I'm here to say is that it takes one to shift the situation mm -hmm. now it would be great to have two yeah. but to to Take that one and pair them with a coach that helps to navigate through this these spaces will shift it in the right direction. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, one is better than none for sure. And, you know, two conflict-free homes is better than one with conflict. Um, the kid will always gravitate towards the healthy parent. So anytime I, we work with somebody that, you know, they just they can't take it anymore. My ex is crazy. She, you know, he or she is driving me nuts and is not being fair and is doing all these things in front of the kid. We say, look, you know, the, your child is going to gravitate towards a healthy parent. And so be that healthy parent. And eventually that should work for you. I would say I would say there is a little bit of there's just the dysfunction. A lot of times a child will feel like they have to manage or um, nor uh, the the want the parent that's most needy and most unhealthy. A lot yeah. of times, it does have the appearance that they chosen the unhealthy parent over the healthy parent. But I think that a lot of what's going on is they're like, my healthy parent will be okay. I need to take care of my, you know, and <laughs> the unhealthy yeah. parent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would share something with you there. And, and I, this would be a question I was going to ask Dawn or, or either of you. So, you know, sometimes I feel that way with my daughter. Like I've seen her, you know, every a couple of weeks of her life and holiday time. And I, I wouldn't say I'm alienated, you know, the way some poor parents are. But I definitely feel sometimes that, you know, her mom is, is you know, doing something to her brain that is, is not, you know, is, is making her feel that, you know, dad is not equal. Mm -hmm. And uh, a quick example is every time she's with me, you know, for the weekend or whatever, I put her to bed, you know, good night. She said, I say, good night. I love you. She says, I love you too, dad. And on the phone, we speak every night on the phone when she's with her mom and we hang up the phone. I say, good night. I love you. She says, bye. <clears throat> it's like, she doesn't want to say it. If, if she knows her mom's somewhere in the background or even nowadays, I mean, this has been going on for years. So maybe, you know, she's not in the background, but she's just, her mind has been trained to not say those words in mom's house. That's the survival mechanism that comes into place with children when they're managing that unhealthy parent. And if she were to be heard saying, I love you, dad, then she is going to be antagonized possibly, um, maybe punished or just getting grief sometimes about mm -hmm. saying that. I think and it's more the latter. You know, she, she's not gonna be punished and, and her mom outwardly will show that you know i'm important in her daughter's life but I, there's under the surface something some going on there feels that she yeah. can't speak that in front of her mother and it could be so minor to the child i mean to the child they might think it's like i just i don't even want to hear her say anything it may mm -hmm. not be anything her mother is intending but yeah. the child goes into that self-preservation mode and they eliminate certain things that they fear could take place because they have to manage that whole situation in order to be safe and survive it. So Dawn, you know, I, I've heard some people say, just, you know, keep being the healthy parent and the child will eventually come around, you know, they might be 18 or 20 years old, but eventually they'll snap out of it and realize what was going on. And I've heard other parents or other people say, that's hogwash, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that, but it also never happens automatically. I can guarantee you 100% 
if you step back, like I've heard judges say, wait till they're 18, they'll know what to do. I did not know what to do. Yeah. I had no idea that I needed to go do something. I'm the child. What would I need to do? Why isn't he in my life? So the with the judge, those messages are inaccurate. And yeah. some parents, I think, listen to that and they think they're doing the right thing, but their child's sitting there thinking, where is he? Why yeah. isn't he? Looking? Where is she? Why isn't she looking for me? Why do I have to do all this work? I'm their child. And that's the, the position children will often take. And they don't know that they can do something about it. And that we're putting that pressure on them where my suggestion is be the consistent parent so that they know no matter what the other parent says, I can always rely on this fact. So and like eventually they'll, they'll be able to determine what they've witnessed when they become adults. So in, in my story there, I thought about, should I talk to my daughter about the whole I love you thing? And But I don't think I want to like put her in a bad spot. I think I just want to be consistent and just keep saying I love you, good night. No, I think you should always say that. Never change that because she's probably loving to hear that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important that she hears that. If you do talk to your daughter, what I would suggest is to, instead of saying, hey, why don't you say you love me? Yeah. Because that puts her on That's the spot. Yeah. You would say, you know, I know that you know that I love you and I love telling you that I love you, but I know that sometimes it's difficult and you don't feel comfortable saying it, but I know that you love me too. Yeah. Yeah. And just let her know that I'm okay with this. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's what I thought was the right move mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Because right, you very love that you love her and she needs you to know that she loves you, but she may not always be able to say it. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, a lot of times I, you know, I've seen it where parents are, uh, it's those, it's those unspoken messages that get um, conveyed to the child by the unhealthy parent. It, the unhealthy parent even may say, I would never stand in the way of you having a relationship with your father or your mother, but I'm so sad when you're gone. Yeah, <laughs> those attitudes and sometimes just the look like Ugh, yeah can't. well my daughter um you know we, we would do the phone call thing and when she's with me she would talk to her mom on my phone and and at some point she showed up at my house with like a special watch like a wasn't an apple watch but some kitty version of a watch where her mom can text her and call her on the watch and i'm saying i said well that's awesome you know can i get the number i, I would like to use the watch when she's with you or can you she take her ipad home to mom's house and we'll do a facetime or no 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 yeah, can't have the number can't take the iphone home child. yeah the child and, should be able to say i want to i want to text dad real quick yeah mm -hmm. right and the fact that it's in one direction but not the other like kind of like blows my mind but I'm at the point where I, I don't want to like, you know, take legal action about it. You know, I want to just try to be the healthy parent. And I feel, I feel, I feel that for you. And unfortunately, if mom's going to say, no, you can't have the number. I mean, it's kind of like, you're, you're kind of stuck because if you ask your daughter for it, then she might feel like that pressure and it might make things complicated. So I don't know no. what the best method there is, but knowing that, um, if you, if you keep asking, just keep asking. Yeah. Yeah. And don't, yeah. don't react to the answer. Don't get mad at the answer. Just say, Hey, I would really like to be able to just once in a while, just text her and say, I love her. Yeah. When I figure she's 12 now. So soon enough, she'll have some kind of a phone or device for herself. That's, that's the other thing. So I'm waiting for that. Yeah. And as she gets older, sometimes, you know, we do have to allow our kids to become more and more independent and more of the, com com the conversation or communication decisions should be including the child so they can say either way. If, if she's with you and say, hey, I want to call mom real quick and tell her about what, what we just did. Yeah. That should be an okay thing. Absolutely, there should never yeah. be anything wrong with that. Well, yeah. I'll tell you, as, as they get older, there's a reason why schools are broken up into elementary, middle school, and high school because the natural progression of uh, leading to independence. Mm -hmm. And if the child has only been uh, around a parent who's got to have them under in their control and and um, that's so needy for them mm -hmm. that that's going to go well it's a couple of combinations first mm -hmm. of all the child is not going to have their the natural healthy growth of independence mm -hmm. or it's going to cause conflict 
because they're mm-hmm. like, I am tired of being controlled. And, you know, and then they rip themselves out of this very mm-hmm. enmeshed mm-hmm. kind of relationship. And that's so why I think it's important that you just keep asking, hey, you know, mm-hmm. we, I'd love to be able to have the number someday. And if she says no, then say, okay. And then you could tell, you could say it to your daughter, say, someday when I have your number, I'm going to call you just to say, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> you're putting the seed in her head that, hey, dad just wants to tell me he loves me. What's the big deal? And maybe that conversation will take place. And so what you're doing is you're, you're having that um, positive messaging going both ways to the mom and to your child. And I think that's really important to help strategize and be able to open that communication. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's good advice. Awesome. Well, it looks like we have about four minutes left. Uh, so uh, is there anything that that is that has been left unsaid that you want to speak to the last um, thing that you want people to walk away with? Well, um, I, you know, we say a lot of times in our book, you know, if, if both parents read the book, you'll get synergies will develop and more people, you know, will um, have better outcomes. And, you know, we're not just saying that to try to sell more books. I mean, you can hand the other person the book. Uh, but the point is, I think that if, if both parents have these questions answered, that's where you really get some solutions and some better things. So, you know, we already covered most of the stuff about coaching and parenting and all those, those good things. Um, you know, I really enjoyed your previous shows with, um, you know, Mark, the uh, person that runs the, um, you know, trying to train people about how to talk to their uh, constituents or their, their, their senators, their locals. So I would like to try to reach out to him and, and, and learn more about what he does. And, um, you know, we were on the Father's Rights Movement earlier this summer on their show with uh, Rosa. And I saw you, um, you you did your show the other day with Casey. And, uh, you know, so I'd like to uh, try to get a hold of him also and see if uh, there's anything we can do to help their cause. Because I really do, I have become a believer in the 50-50 thing. Mm-hmm. And if I could go back in time, um, you know, that's something maybe I would have tried to do differently in my life. Uh, you know, we, we had a long geographic distance, but I, I always going to wonder what would have been different if I would have had 50% of the time. Yeah, I think it's very important for children to have access to both parents and that 50 50, which is why I strive to find or to fight for that um, rebuttable presumption of equal shared parenting. That's not to say that I want a child to be in an unhealthy circumstance. Mm -hmm. Never would I condone any kind of violence, abuse or anything like that. However, when there is no presence of any kind of danger, the child has an inalienable right to their biological parents. That's something that was decided that you didn't realize was being decided, right, at the time. So if we start putting the children's first and what they want to know, because they're gonna become adults and they're the ones that ultimately own their life. So decisions that are made while they're children are going to impact them as an adult. And when they start to see and realize, my parents did this right, or my parents didn't do this so well. Yeah. And they start forming their own opinions and, and that's, that can really jeopardize the relationships at that point. So I think having this book really can help parents realize that it's all for the child and yeah. that you want them to be the happiest person and the most successful adult they could possibly be. That's the goal of parenting, right? We don't own them. We only have them for a short period of time to teach them how to be adults. And I think that is a very important message. And I think that co-parenting is the best way to achieve that. Yeah. And, you know, just a, one more quick story would be, you know, God made two parents to have two influences on, on a child's life and to take one of those influences away or marginalize one of those influences is a huge mistake, I think. And, you know, I, I just sort of realized as we're recently you know, I'll have my daughter with me sometimes and we try to put her on a movie and it's almost as if she doesn't trust my judgment on the movie and she has to check with her mom first to see if it's okay to watch that movie. Where it should be, you have two parents, they both see the world a little bit differently and maybe dad is more lenient, mom is more strict or vice versa. But the benefit is you're getting two points of view views on all these different issues, whether it's a movie or, you know, anything, you name it. And to take one of those views and marginalize it or, or hush it up or teach your kid that it's not valid, you're just doing a huge disservice to them. So even if you disagree with your co-parent on these issues, 
you got to let them influence the child. And that's a very important influence for their adult life, because look at today, we have two different points of view, three or four different points of view, but they kind of want us all to have the same point of view. And Mm -hmm. if you don't have that same point of view, then you're bad. And Mm -hmm. that is what we're showing children, that there's only one point of view that's right. Right. But we have to have those outside influences to help shape and mold our own morals and standards, because that's something we have to do internally. Nobody can say what that is. They can't put that stamp on you. So I think that's absolutely a perfect way to describe that. Hey, by the way, do you guys know an organization called, it's in Florida, called Our Children Have Rights? Yeah, they. one of the, the founders is... Um, from our hometown, and I spoke to yeah. them yes a uh, couple days ago. This week, right? Yeah, uh, Greg or Jake. Uh, yeah. Both of them. Yeah, we we've been working with them for the last year. They're they're good guys and have a great organization. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, keep awesome. keep that conversation going as well. Gotcha, definitely. Well, we want to thank you so much for joining us and coming here and talking about your book, which is available um, on Amazon. It's also available in audio as well. So. Yeah. Baby Out of Wedlock is the name of the book. Go to the website. It's also the same, www.babyoutofwedlock.com. There's all kinds of information out there. They give free advice or free counseling. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, and anybody can reach out to us with a question, yeah. email. We'll, we'll even get on the phone with somebody if they want to talk. Yeah, great, great resource. And that's the, that's the key is having access to some really good resource tools will help go a long way. So thank you again for joining us so much. We're going to say goodbye for now, but you two stay put. We'll be with you in just a second. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for joining us again. We'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Thanks for having us. Bye.